there's no escaping it. Not for me, all the way out here, and probably not for you either. Even out here at my remote cabin in Alaska, I am still dependent upon the electric grid. Yet every week I have a power outage. You've gotta be kidding me. Whether it's lasting for a few seconds or it's lasting for several hours, it happens every single week and it's unpredictable. I've been told that the longest this area has gone without electricity has been for three solid days. And recently, some of the major power stations in the lower 48 were not operable. And that caused several thousands of people, tens of thousands, I'm sure, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people to be without power for extended periods. And then as the power stations began to come back online, there were rolling power outages. And I know that rolling power outages are becoming more and more common. But it got me to think about resolving that. In addition to needing to power my workstations up above, I also have four freezers that I power on a daily basis. Now, I decided that I was going to run a little experiment to see how long I could keep the food in my freezers frozen without the use of electricity. I really want to see how long could I survive in this cabin without relying upon the electric grid. Now, I'm not going to spoil any of the food in my freezers. So what I did is I emptied out this particular freezer and in place of the food, I have put in some Arctic Tundra ice blocks that I had purchased previously from Bass Pro. I'm not sponsored by Bass Pro, but if ever they wanted to, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> not doesn't have to be ice blocks either. It could be fishing gear, but I digress. So as I mentioned, the experiment is going to be to see how long I can keep these Arctic Tundra ice blocks frozen. I also put in two bags of water. One is a quart size, one's a gallon size, and then I put in a package of stew meat and I put a thermometer in there. It is now 28 hours later and I'm happy to report that everything is a solid block of ice in there still. It is 15 degrees in the freezer currently and the ambient temperature of this room is 57 degrees right now. So, so far I'm pleased. I'm going to continue to run this experiment and see how long could the, this freezer remain frozen without the use of electricity. You're probably thinking, Ellen, why don't you just get solar and be done with it? Well, solar is not really the best option for me, at least not a whole home solar system. For one, it's very costly and I'm just looking at backup power. If you're on the grid and you're getting solar installed on your home, mainly the reason that people do that is so that they can reduce their expense that they're paying back to the local utility company month after month. Because those solar systems produce more energy than you're likely to use, the utility company will take that energy and buy it back from you and provide you basically with a rebate on your utility bill. So it reduces your overall utility expense each month. But there's a problem with this, and that is, and this is something I don't think most people know unless you've investigated getting solar added to your home that is already tied into the grid, is that when the grid goes down, so does your solar system. And it's for a safety reason. Because when the lineman goes out to repair the line, he cannot have any current in that line traveling in any direction. And so your solar system is going to have a fail-safe setup into it that's going to take it offline until the grid comes back online, in which case it'll power back on. If it's offline, that means that it is no longer producing energy for you. And yes, while you might be able to tap into the battery bank that is currently there, in a large long-term grid down situation, that's not gonna work for you because it's not gonna be able to produce any more energy to replenish those battery banks. So those are the two main reasons why I'm not doing it. The other thing is, is that those require a large bay of solar panels. I, even though I have quite a bit of property here, I really don't have an area that's suitable to those solar panels because I have plans for the clearing that's in the back of my property and I don't really want to see them in the front of my property. 
And let's be honest, I don't want to go out and clear the snow off of them either. Now, I know that they'll still produce some solar in the winter months, even though the sun really isn't available where I live. The sun never makes it much above the horizon in the winter months here. And because I live in a forest, I never see the sun other than a small little peak through the trees every now and then. But as far as seeing it above the tree line, that doesn't happen. So while I could produce a small amount of energy, and while I don't actually consume that much energy, on average, I'm going between 175 and 380 kilowatt hours a month, which is about half of the average household, I don't really need a whole home solar system. So instead, to power my computer, since I can't get away from that, since that's how I make a living, I plan on getting a lithium ion generator battery pack. And those actually are going to receive energy initially from the grid. So as long as I do have power to the cabin, those battery banks are going to be constantly being filled up with grid power. So what do I do when the grid goes down? Well, let's head downstairs and we'll talk about that. Before I get too far into this conversation, I do want to make mention that what I'm about to say has nothing to do with an apocalyptic end of the world scenario. That's not what I'm talking about. My concern is regarding how shoddy or faulty the electricity has been here at my property. And it may be along this entire side of Alaska. When the electricity has gone out here, I can call the electric company and report the outage. And typically they'll tell me, you know, what's caused the outage um, or where the outage has been reported from, like between this mile marker and that mile marker. So I know that it's really not just my cabin. And knowing that grid down situations are becoming more and more commonplace throughout the United States, it's made me think about this um, test basically that I'm running here. But I want to expand upon that test. If the power station here in this part of Alaska were to become compromised for whatever reason, and it was down for an extended period of time, how long could I possibly go without reliance upon the electric grid? Could I go a year? Well, what would it take to go a year without electricity? Now I mentioned buying the lithium ion generator and the batteries will quickly become depleted in that as I you know, use them for my computers upstairs. And I also need to think about powering these freezers. So how am I going to do that? Well, to be honest with you, I'm probably gonna to have to buy a generator. Now, I'm not talking about a whole home generator. Uh, that would be nice too, but that's a lot of money also. What I'm more thinking about is purchasing something smaller like a Honda uh, gas generator. And that would require me to go to one of the local fuel stations to buy fuel to replenish it. And that's not a problem. Again, I'm more concerned about the electric grid than I am with, um, like I said, an apocalyptic situation. So keep that in mind as we proceed in this conversation. I'm not really considering the lights in the cabin. For that, I have oil lamps and headlamps. I have flashlights and things like that. I'm also not considering running the oil burner on the generator unless it absolutely got down like it did over Christmas where it was you know negative 50 wind chill outside that was just stripping the cabin of all of its heat. So only in that situation would I use that for the oil burner. So if I buy the Honda generator I can run a cord in um, to power these freezers. I could potentially power each freezer individually until it gets brought back down to the appropriate temperature and then swap it out for the next um, outlet and the next and the next. Or what I could do is continue doing what I'm planning in my head currently, which is to use the Arctic Tundra ice blocks and you know just swap those out between the various freezers and use the generator to just power the one freezer that's storing the ice blocks. And again, I think that that would probably work best for me. 
one of the other things is with the lithium ion generator is that I could get smaller portable solar panels that I could prop up in a window in the summer months and get solar to replenish the battery on that. Or I could plug it into the generator and replenish the batteries that way. So that's one way that I'm thinking about, or I guess two ways rather, that I'm thinking about circumventing the grid here at my cabin. But one of the other things that we need to talk about are these freezers and some of the thoughts that I had leading up to this point. about surviving long-term in my cabin without electricity, I'm not just talking about the grid going down, but I'm looking to the 18th century and some of the things that they used to do. Um, and I want to incorporate some of those things here at my property. Now, I also need to be a realist and be practical about what I'm thinking about because I do live in the modern society. And I'm also looking to some of the people that I want to emulate some of the things that they did in their daily lives, such as Dick Prennecke, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walden, the list goes on. But they too had to resupply their cabins or their huts or wherever, right? They, they were not completely self-reliant upon themselves. And whether that meant that they were going out and foraging and hunting, or they were going into town to pick up on supplies for things that they could not gather in their own um, environments. And I'll need to do the same thing. So I'm not talking about becoming a hermit and, you know, becoming a shut-in and living solely in my cabin without any contact with the outside world. That's not what this is about. This is just finding ways that I can be more self-reliant here in my own cabin and not be reliant upon the grid that continually is faulty and may can go down for an extended period of time in the future. And again, if I'm thinking about, you know, how long could I survive? Well, my goal is to have enough food in the cabin to survive for a year. Now, I already am shopping for six to eight months, so I'm pretty close to that. And believe it or not, all the meat that's in those freezers is not meant for just one year. That meat is going to get canned up. It's Some of it's going to get dehydrated and turned into jerky. And that meat should carry me for many years, believe it or not. As long as they are good in the cans, then I should have meat to carry me and Kenai through um, for a long time to come. And as you can see behind me, as I'm now in my root cellar, you can see just a very small fraction of some of my canning jars and, you know, canning not only that meat, but some of my vegetables as well, is one of the things that our ancestors used to do and I will be doing here in the very near future on my property. But I'm also thinking about other ways that they preserved their food and especially during the summer months. So right now it's winter time and keeping those freezers cold isn't that hard considering it's not that hot in the cabin. And so there's not really anything to really draw too much of the uh, cold temps out of the freezers, but in the summer months, it's going to be a lot warmer. And what did they do in the past was they were using ice houses. So if you're not familiar with what an ice house is, it typically was a brick dome that was built over a large pit in the ground. And then it would have like a tunnel like entrance off the front of it where they would store lake ice that would be literally sawn into great big blocks as deep as the ice is, maybe six to 12 inches or more deep. And then um, you know, anywhere from two to three feet in width and diameter, and then those would be taken to the ice house. Now that ice house could be meant for just a single home if it was somebody, you know, who was wealthy, or typically what it was, was that it was to supply a community or a village with ice for the summer months. And they would use that ice then to cool down their meats um, and dairy products over the warmer months of the year. I am fascinated by the idea of an ice house and I did think about building one here at my property. For just myself, I, I'm i not going to be able to go and harvest lake ice and I'm not going to be able to dig a pit that deep in the ground where I live. The ground where I live is basically, basically comprised of topsoil 
and then about three feet of clay, and then it's various layers of compacted gravel and river rock underneath the foundation of my property. So that would prevent me from being able to dig down that deep. Though here in Alaska, it is common for there to be what's known as ice cellars. You'll see that more on the Northern Slope or in some of the native communities that have settlements in permafrost areas. I don't really have permafrost here in this area. Um, there are some indeterminate patchy areas of permafrost around me, uh, but it's not directly where I'm at. One of the problems that these settlements are encountering is that as the temperatures rise, the permafrost is melting, and the foods that they've typically been able to store through the summer months are spoiling before winter is coming. And so they're having to look for other ways to uh, circumvent the melting permafrost that they're experiencing. The Amish are still doing this today where they're storing between 25 and 30 tons of ice in their ice houses. Their ice houses are typically large shed type buildings um, that are about 10 by 10, so about the size of an average kitchen. And they're insulated with two thick, two feet thick uh, styrofoam insulation such as this here on all sides. And like I said, the vast amount of ice that they're storing in that is what allows the ice to stay basically frozen year round and allows them refrigeration since they're not using electricity uh, to refrigerate their things. Believe it or not, the first refrigerator was actually invented in 1804. I don't remember the gentleman's name. I'll put that up here on the screen. He invented it in 1804 and basically from 1804 to 1834, nobody really took interest in what he was doing. After that, his idea of a refrigeration machine started to catch on. And it was actually 1926 or 1927 when the first electric refrigerator was actually introduced to the public. Now I'm gonna get into my refrigeration here in just a moment. Now I thought about just purchasing a lot more of the Arctic Tundra ice blocks and storing those in an ice house here on the property. But again, knowing that the Amish are doing this and they're using between 25 and 30 tons of ice in their ice houses. Um, now again, they're trying to supply an entire community I'm only supplying myself, but just knowing, you know, taking into account temperature fluctuations, heat in the summertime, amount of insulation we need, and then the amount of ice that it would need to be stored in there to keep the ice throughout the summertime. It's really not a practical thing for me. This cellar is going to be one of the ways that I survive here long term, um, you know, and not be reliant upon the electric grid. It's about 33 degrees down here right now. And this corner here, as you can see, just houses a small fraction of my canning jars. But along this other wall, I will be installing shelves, much like I have in my pantry upstairs. And so I can store more than a year's worth of food down here. Now, one thing to keep in mind is I'm already buying for six to eight months worth of food every time I go resupply. And, you know, speaking of resupplying, you know, if I look back at Dick Prennicky or Emerson, they were having to go resupply as well. They were not just hermits in their own world, never having contact with the outside world. They were having to bring in supplies of things that they could not produce um, at their own cabins. And I'll have to do the same thing. So again, that's not what this conversation is about. I do have transportation. You know, I'm not talking about a end of the world scenario. So assuming that the fuel stations would still be operable, um, and that I could bring fuel in to supply the generator and what have you. I just want to mention too, that if you're like me and you love to look at old historic buildings and sightseeing, then I highly recommend that you check out Backwaters and Backroads with Britton and Wavy. Um, they are a fantastic duo. If you're, if you're not familiar with their channel, I'll leave a link down below. Um, but really, I go there to see Wavy more than anything. Sorry, Brenton, but Wavy stills the show. She's a little pocket beagle, and she's absolutely adorable. But, um, you know, as I was talking about the ice houses, I was thinking about some of the historic communities that he's been through, and yeah, they're really fantastic. Now that I'm back in my pantry, I want to talk about, you know, surviving long-term 
again, without electricity. My pantry is just one of the ways that I am doing that, as I mentioned with the root cellar down below, where I'll be storing my root crops and, um, you know, my canned goods and things like that. But the food that you can see behind me, this is just a small portion of what it would take to really survive here long term. And, you know, I know that there is a trend going around about pantry challenges, eating only what you have in your pantry without having to run out and go to the store to make dinner or what have you. And those challenges are, you know, eating from your pantry just for 30 days. And Wyoming Homestead recently did one of those. So if you want to check it out, I'll also leave a link to her channel down below. And then there's these, you know, videos that you can see about eating only what we grow on our uh, property, which I do plan on putting a garden in the back of my property this uh, next year or so. And, you know, that's something I need to think about too, is like the seeds and what have you. I have a tub back here behind me that is just absolutely plumb full of seeds. So I will be able to plant my own food and, you know, harvest my own crops and what have you. But then how am I gonna store things that need to be refrigerated and not frozen? Um, and not canned and what have you. Currently in the winter months, I'm literally just using my windowsill. I set my cream literally in the windowsill overnight. If I have a condiment of some sort, say a jelly or, um, you know, something that I've opened up that needs to be refrigerated, I set it all in the windowsill. But if you've watched some of my previous videos where I've shown my pantry, you may have noticed this door right here. Well, behind here is just a big open space that's not really being utilized right now. My plan for this though, is to turn it into my own ice box to replace my Yeti cooler. Don't get me wrong, I love my Yeti, who could also sponsor me by the way, but really I would like a more permanent upright refrigeration system. Again, that doesn't rely upon electricity. And I got this idea from Boss at Boss of the Swamp he had done this in a couple of his cabins and so i'll be incorporating the same idea here utilizing five inches of styrofoam on all sides of this opening including the door and then venting it to the outside so i'll be using the outside air to cool off the items that are inside of my future ice box I can regulate that temperature by opening and closing the vent that I will have installed. Um, and then I will also cool it in the warmer months using ice blocks from the freezer. So I'm hoping that that works. It seems to have worked well for Boss, otherwise he wouldn't have repeated that in his future cabins. This is again, nothing new. It's not new technology. It went from the ice house to the ice box then to the modern refrigerator and freezers. And so I'm taking a step back and I'm going a bit backwards here at my cabin. In the summer months, I'm actually using my Yeti cooler um, and the ice blocks as I have mentioned. But the, the problem with using the Yeti cooler and these ice blocks is the Yeti itself is very well made and very insulating. And then these things are super cold. So anything that comes in contact with the ice blocks in there is going to freeze. And um, yeah, I've lost more food in the Yeti uh, due to things freezing that shouldn't have frozen than I did from anything spoiling because it was too warm in the Yeti. So it's been over 48 hours since I started this experiment with the freezers. And I'm very pleased to report that everything is still performing really well in here. It is about 15 degrees still inside of the freezer and everything is still frozen. This is the stew meat that was frozen when I put it in there. It's not showing any signs of thawing, neither are the bags of water. The only thing that is actually showing any signs of thawing are these smaller um, ice packs. You can hear that they're starting to liquefy, but the larger packs have quite a bit less of fluidity to them. So that's a good thing. I'm very pleased with how this is going. I'm gonna continue to leave this freezer off and see how long I can keep things frozen in there. 
So I do want to touch on a couple of other things though about the premise of being able to survive here for one full year um, without really having to do too much outside of the property. Like I said, I might have to go get fuel for um, the Honda generator if I purchase that. Um, you know, I know that I myself have a tendency to want to go sightseeing. I want to go fishing. I want to go hunting, things like that. So that those things could potentially take me off the property, the fishing for sure, because I don't have fish here on the property. But I also wanted to touch on that there are other aspects to living remotely and, and being independent. And part of that comes from uh, water. I need to be able to go get water since I don't have water on my property. But I do have plenty of water storage. So I have four 55 gallon water safe barrels that I can store water in. Plus I have two smaller 14 gallon barrels that I use for my faucet. And then I have all my water jugs that are like five and between five and seven gallons a piece. So I have plenty of water storage, not to mention the 500 gallons that I store in the root cellar uh, that is for my fire suppression system. If I really needed to, I could drink that water. I'm not really wanting to because it's pretty gross. But in the wintertime, also, I can melt snow. And in the summertime, I can collect rainwater because it does rain here quite a bit. So water is all taken care of. On top of that, then, there comes the heat source. I mentioned previously the oil burner. But I also have the ability to get firewood delivered to me since I am on the road system. Um, right now, I'm getting enough firewood to last me through the year, which is typically about seven to eight cords that I'm burning through in a year's time. But I can also go harvest wood since I live right in the forest. I have chainsaws and means of felling trees and bucking up that wood. Um, I There's plenty of dead standing out there. And if I had to, I could, you know, chop down trees and let them, um, you know, dry over the course of a couple of years um, if I was proactive about it. So these are all just things to keep in mind if you're thinking about living a similar lifestyle. But for me, it really comes down to I'm just trying to make my life as independent as I can and not be so reliant upon modern technology and the electric grid because in my opinion those things are set up to fail. So I don't want to fail and it's because of you that I have actually been successful here on YouTube and so I want to say thank you again to each and every one of you who are subscribed and who are channel members, Patreon members, who have supported me through donations on PayPal, merchandise um, purchases, as well as super thanks, and those that have sent gifts to me um, or purchased things off of my Amazon wish list. Um, all of you are amazing. And if you're watching this video, I hope that you remember to give it a thumbs up. If you have made it this far, you obviously like the video. And I also hope that you're a subscriber. And if not, just click that button and be sure to stick around for some outtakes. Otherwise, I'll be back in just a few days with another video. Oh, I am going to switch up my format of how I'm posting my videos. Um, so for those of you who are channel members, this week you received a longer sneak peek than what you've seen in the past. It was a full uh, five minutes and that's what my goal will be going forward is to do roughly between three to five minutes worth of video for you as a sneak peek. Then um, later on in the week, I will be posting a short that will be basically just the very first minute of my videos as a trailer um, to attract new uh, viewers to my channel. And then at the end of the week on Friday um, or Saturday morning, depending upon um, the conditions here at the cabin, I'll be posting the long format video. So that's what my new direction will be going into 2023 with the channel. And um, if you are interested in joining as a channel member, just realize that the perks for that are that you get priority access to the comments, uh, meaning that I will respond to your comments first and foremost, and that you do get a sneak peek well in advance of anybody else as to what my videos are about. And um, yeah, so again, thank you for watching. Here's some funny outtakes. 
And again, take care, stay safe, and until next time, I wish you all the best. I'm gonna get, what is that thing called? I keep forgetting. <laughs> Ah, um, because if the Yeti, or if the Yeti, the problem with the Yeti cooler and the, I, but, 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 uh, I do this every video. So currently it's, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying.